I'm Saba. I'm going to be talking about how we package, deploy, and run Apache Spark applications at Mapbox. So let's we'll start with what the problem is. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with what Mapbox does, we provide um, SDKs, APIs, and tooling for developers who want to integrate maps, navigation, um, in their applications. Um, to this day, we have a, a 1 million registered developers, and this means that we collect data back from around 300 million applications running Mapbox. And this actually maps out to be around 220 million miles of um, anonymized mobile location at a day. So obviously that's a huge amount of data, um, but today I'm not going to be talking about how we deal with um, those large amounts of data. I'm going to be talking about a whole different problem. How do we give everyone at Mapbox access to this data that we're collecting so that they can make data-driven decisions and um, they can harvest this data and um, make use of it? Um, so we, we figured out that there's a huge wide range of use cases. Um, people want to run experiments on it, they want to analyze it, aggregate it, transform it, and query it, and even write machine learning algorithms against it. So it's a very diverse use case. So we, and here the data engineering team, um, decided that we needed to provide Mapbox with a unified data platform. And the reason behind this is that, so that we, the data engineering team, can remove ourselves as a blocker to, towards this data so that we can give everyone at Mapbox the ability to build their own pipelines, to build their own data processing applications um, so that we're no longer a barrier, so that everyone can have access to this data and we can make very good data-driven decisions at Mapbox. So the data platform that we want to build would have to, have to do a lot. It would have to handle the ingestion of this data, it would have to handle storage, um, the data processing, and, um, and have to provide tools for analysis. And as we started building this out, we started to realize that Apache Spark is going to be a very key component of this infrastructure. And what attracted us to Spark is because of its data processing capabilities that we all know of, but also that it has Spark SQL and then additional libraries like MLlib um, that Spark provides. We also realized that for us to be successful, um, people at Mapbox would have to adopt this technology and would have to adopt this new tech that we're adding to the stack, which is Spark. And we realized that if you model something around something that's already familiar to everyone, they're more likely to adopt it and they're more likely to use it and that means we're more successful because our major goal is to have everyone adopt this new technology and adopt this new platform that we're building. So our underlying goal after all of this is that we want all of our users to develop PySpark applications just like they would any other piece of software at Mapbox. So all the tooling and all of the infrastructure that we would have to build would have to be geared around that. How do we make packaging and deploying and building Spark applications be just like any other piece of software at Mapbox? So let's start by taking a look at what our data pipeline looks like. Uh, we have data coming in in um, an ingestion, and it all ends up into our data lake, which is S3. And then we have these Spark applications, which we call data transformation applications, that uh, take this data from S3. It cleans it up, defines a schema around it, partitions it, and, um, and writes it to the final data warehouse. We use this tool called MBX Data, which I'm going to be talking about, that um, allows us to manage these Spark applications and actually all Spark applications that are deployed at Mapbox. And then the Spark applications also use a Python module that we have built and that's installed on all of our Spark clusters called MBX Spark. And the reason we have MBX Spark is to ensure that we're writing to both our Metastores, Glue, and Hive in the same manner. And if you're wondering why we have two Metastores, it's because of the diverse use case I had mentioned. We have analysts who love Athena, um, and you know, Athena is great for, for writing SQL queries, so we need to have Glue which backs Athena. And then we also have Hive, um, which basically powers the Spark applications that um, people are writing at Mapbox and are part of um, the data pipelines that we have at Mapbox as well. So this is, yes, this is basically what the processing part of our data pipeline looks like. So what does building Spark applications at Mapbox look like? 
Um, we, as I mentioned, we have this thing called MBX data, and what MBX data is, is a command line tool that we have built that is basically the gateway to our data warehouse. It is like how everyone at Mapbox interacts with their data. If you don't have MBX data, you don't have access to our data. And um, this gave us a lot of power to onboard people really easily and to have everyone use our data in one, in, in one way. Um, so the three commands that I'll be focusing on today are MBX data build, and that what that does is it builds a bundle of your Spark applications, and in that bundle has everything it needs to run in production. And I'll also be talking about MBX data run, which actually allows you to run that bundle on a real Spark cluster. And then finally, MBX data deploy, which allows you to schedule those Spark applications. And this command line tool is what was built with Node.js. So at the beginning, and just so again, like I have to reiterate that we want everyone to build Spark applications just, just like they would any other application. You start with a GitHub repo, and you start writing your Spark application, and, and then once you have your logic in there and you have your, your Spark application, um, MBX data requires you to write a job configuration. And the reasoning behind why we enforce this job configuration is um, because it basically tells MBX data what it needs to build and run your application. Um, so if we take a look at what this configuration looks like, um, the first block up there is the runtime because we allow actually Python 2 jobs in Python 3. Um, so that's what that's there for. And then we also have these things, uh, the parameters object, and that is for runtime parameters. So for parameters that are going to change over the life cycle of your application, and you don't want to actually put them in your application, you want to be able to like supply the values of these parameters as you're building your application. And the final, and of course, uh, if you have sensitive information like API keys that you do not want to be committed to GitHub, you can provide them at runtime. The final um, object there with the jobs key, that's the list of jobs that you could have in your Spark repo. Um, so we allow like multiple jobs and that's how you would define which job is which. And the constraint here is that like job underscore one has to match the name of the, main, of the Python file of the main function for the Spark application. So now you have your Spark application, it's in a GitHub repo and um, you have a job configuration associated with it, uh, then the next step to do is that you actually want to build this application so you can run it in production. So you type in MBX data build and you provide an environment name. And what that environment name does is it just um, builds a stack according to that build. Um, so in this example, I'm using production. We're building a production bundle. And the first step that happens there is that your job configuration is validated. And once that's determined to be validated, you're actually prompted for your runtime variables that were defined in the job configuration. So you would define the values for those runtime variables or runtime parameters. And then what MBX data build does is it packages all this information into a payload. Um, so in that payload, we have like the GitHub repo um, information the build environment name, which in this case is production, and then the key and values for the parameters JSON. So what MBX data build does with this payload, it actually triggers a lambda called spork. And what's, sorry, I don't know, it's not moving. <laughs> what spork does is it um, creates a bundle that is runnable on Apache Spark. And, um, and delivers it to S3. So um, as we saw, like that, what the payload has in it is the is that GitHub repo name, which is Spark app, and the build environment name, which is production, and then the parameters JSON, which is like the key and value of the parameters that you passed in as a user. And then it will build a S3 path for where it wants to put that bundle on S3. And if you look at what the S3 path looks like, um, it's it's a combination of your GitHub repo name, the stack name, which is production, and then a git sha, param sha, um, unique identifier. And the git sha is actually the git sha of your latest commit. 
And um, yeah, and the prime shell is just generated from the parameters file. So the reason we do this is to create this like trap of bundles that you are putting on S3, so that um, you know if you're developing like machine learning models and uh, you want to track actually like with every build, um, but as you're you're iterating over your model, you can definitely do that. So every build creates its own new bundle on S3 and there's a trace of all those bundles. So once that S3 path is built and determined, what Sport will do next is it will start generating all the bundle contents. And um, what those are is like the parameters file, the dependencies, which is from the requirements of TXT, and uh, Spark application Python files, and then a dynamically generated init script, which points to the entry point of your Spark application, and then it finally triggers an AWS code build, and what code build simply does is it pulls in the dependencies um, from the requirements of TXT and builds a big bundle.zip with all those components. So once you have this bundle um, on S3 that is, um, has everything your application needs to run on production, you could either do MBX data run or MBX data deploy. And the difference between the two is run will just run your application on an Apache, on a Spark cluster, and we'll show you the results. And <coughs> MBX data deploy will actually schedule it. So the difference in the prompt is that deploy will ask you, like, how often do you want to schedule this? And we'll build a schedule. And we actually use Kubel, um, which is a, a data service or a data platform, um, to uh, manage our Spark clusters. And so we use their API to submit our jobs to the smart clusters. So what MBX data run and deploy mainly do is they build this Spark submit string. And for those of you who are familiar with Spark, Spark submit is actually is a script uh, available on all Spark clusters that allows you to submit applications to it. So the Spark submit string looks like this. Um, the thing in pink is like the Spark configuration, so a user would pass to Spark. So if they want to overwrite them to optimize them for their applications. And then the Python files that are all in the bundle.zip. So this is where the build step comes in. And then finally, like the init script, which is the entry point to your application. And then the name of the job that you want to run. So if we take a step back and take a look at what um, deploying and running Spark applications look like at Mapbox. Um, so yeah, you start with your GitHub repo that has your Spark application and a job configuration template. You write unit tests against those. We provide all Spark um, repos with a Docker file that sets up um, PySpark and Hive for you. And then you would run MBX data build, which does template validation, asks you for runtime parameters, and puts that bundle onto S3 using the Lambda Spark. Once that bundle is on S3, MBX data run and deploy can fetch that bundle and run it on a real Spark cluster, which we manage using Google. And um, we use two minus stores, Glue and Hive, so that we can run Athena and allow our users to run, um, to write their own Spark processing jobs. So wrapping up, uh, we basically build, built this process that's around deploying Spark applications. And by doing it in a way that's familiar to everyone at Mapbox, we were successful with having more people adopt it quickly. And using something like Kubel really helped us get there quicker because they had a mature API that we can submit things to. And um, we, most our tooling was basically mostly built around um, technology that we're already familiar with, so that actually enabled us to get to our goal pretty quickly. And that's it. So we timed this a little bit better, uh, so we have about five minutes for Q&A. Um, so obviously you are heavily dependent on Amazon staff like Lambda. And is it good to, uh, a reason to do that? So what are some of the gotchas you had? Because you're so reliant on Amazon tooling and all of that. Um, I'm not sure if we have any like real gotchas. Like it was actually all pretty smooth because, as I said, like we that's the stack that we're familiar with at Mapbox. Like we have years and years of experience with building using lambdas and code build and stuff like that. Um, so I can't say like we ever ran into like oh this doesn't work because we were already familiar with the technology quite thoroughly. Okay. I 
have you seen any changes in like, project velocity, for example, after adapting the documents? Absolutely. Um, so by enabling like different teams to build their own pipelines, like we were no longer the blocker. Um, so they were no longer like waiting on us to write Spark jobs or anything like that. So it just like paralyzed the process quite heavily. And um, yeah, and then so we just saw like people that like you've never even heard of just like writing their own Spark applications and running them. And this is really great. Um, when you're showing the architecture diagram, we saw that like three fourths of it, like you mentioned, is heavily dependent on Amazon product. And then I see there is a sudden third party call to Cubo there. Um, I was wondering if you considered something like EMR, uh, which is which makes your entire pipeline unified. And if not, why not? So we're migrating off of EMR. This this whole a big part of this process was to get off of EMR. Um, we just. Uh, we found EMR a little bit like hard to manage, and it's not very user friendly. Um, so, if you know, our goal here is to have a lot of people use the stuff that we're building. So, having a UI um, like Cubal's UI, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but it, it allows you to write notebooks and and write like um, really interactive Spark jobs, and uh, you can see like the feedback right away. Um, so, for us to build something that's usable by people who are not familiar with Spark, we needed to use something like Cubal rather than EMR. Um, so, hey, uh, question about uh, so how do you experience, like, how do you like the uh, glue? Because as I know, like, I used to work in the team uh, glue and it just launched uh, June last year. Mm -hmm. How do you like it? And, uh, yeah, it's been pretty good so far. Um, uh, like we use it mainly because we we like Athena a lot, um, so it integrates really well with Athena. The APIs that's um, around Glue are really good. So like I mentioned that we use MBX Spark, which is like our own Python module that writes to Glue and Hive in the same way and makes sure both metastores are in sync. Um, so yeah, so the APIs were great. Like we could write to Glue um, from our code and. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's been a pretty good experience so far. And so you just mentioned, so you you will give up EMR and then choose other clusters. So will it integrate well with the glue? Like, with uh, does EMR integrate yeah. well with glue? Yeah. Is that I the mean, question? I mean, um, non EMR cluster. Oh yeah, yeah no, good point. So Cubal does not integrate with glue, so that's why we have to have Hive as well. Um, because, yeah, unfortunately, Cubal doesn't integrate with Glyph. Okay. 